One of the biggest things about AI and about technology in general is technology turns what used to be 80-20 into 90-10. 80-20 says 20% creates 80% of the results and 80% creates 20% of the results. That's true in the high friction brick and mortar world. That's true of plumbers and taco stands and automobiles and roads and, and all that kind of stuff. Internet is 90-10. On the internet, 10% of the companies have 90% of the business and 90% of the companies have 10% of the business. And the difference between the haves and have nots is not 16 to one, it's 80 to one. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns. This is the show we share cutting edge strategies to help marketing directors, CMOs, kings of business to acquire leads and sales to ultimately achieve your vision. And Kasim, speaking of kings, kings of business, kings of our industry, we have somebody here today that I certainly have a long uh, standing relationship with, I've known for many, many years. He was the first book I ever read on internet marketing and advertising, his Google pay-per-click book, which he's obviously expanded out tremendously since then. He's now one of those forward thinkers, dare I say, futurist of our space, but not only just our space, but just humanity and philosophy just in general. And I think we have a pre- amazing guest here on perpetual traffic and one that I'm super excited. I can't believe it's taken us 550 some odd shows to have him on board, but we've got Perry Marshall here today on perpetual traffic. What do you think about that? I'm speechless, Ralph. <laughs> There's nothing I could add to that introduction outside of the fact that uh, I'm a, I'm a big Perry Marshall fan. If you haven't heard of Perry, he's an impossible person to encapsulate. Um, and he's worth the Google, like, you know, his, his writing, he's got a, a blog and he talks about theology and health and business and, um, just a really, really interesting dude who's fun to listen to. And I think that everybody's going to get a lot out of this, this talk and this interview. I'm excited. Yeah. I think if you're a, if you're a digital marketing person, and obviously if you're listening to this show and you've been listening to any shows, you're probably familiar with his book. 80, you can't be in marketing and not have come across Perry Marshall's books, even if you don't realize it. it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And yeah. I, you know, just a, a shameless plug that, that we we actually pr help promote and launch this book way back when. Me and my former partner can't believe it. He's nodding his head, yes. And I remember it was a picture of Perry with a penny on the image. And that was like the crushing creative. It's like nothing could ever beat it. Picture of Perry with a penny. So there you go. Simple, simple graphics. But anyway, uh, that sort of took his career, I think, to that next level. And now here we're going to be talking about not necessarily 80-20 marketing. If you think about Perry Mar Marshall, it's just that. There is so much more to that. Um, but that's sort of what a lot of people will know him for. So anyway, obviously, uh, super excited to have Perry Marshall on the show. We're going to pull him out of the virtual green room here. Welcome to Perpetual Traffic. Where have you been for the last 500 episodes? Perry, thanks for coming on. It's an honor to be on this show. And Kasim, I love talking to you. Ralph, I love talking to you. And uh, we're going to talk about a lot of crazy stuff today. And let's just dive right in because it's Serious, intense stuff. Serious and intense stuff. So I, I had a conversation yesterday with some friends. One of my buddies is uh, is in this mastermind that's built around living forever. So it's a bunch of like obnoxiously wealthy people that now have decided they want to be immortal. And mm -hmm. they bring in all these thought leaders and, and experts. And they brought in that, and you guys have probably heard of him. His, his name's Brian Johnson. He's that uh, billionaire Silicon Valley guy that spends $2 million a year trying to stay 18 years old. You know what I'm talking about? I've heard of him. So I don't know anything about Brian, but he said something um, that my friend relayed that I thought was really, really interesting and, and actually pretty poignant. He said, for the first time in history, it's impossible to predict what's going to happen four months from now. And I thought, first of all, that's a really specific timeline. And I don't know why he chose four months and not three or five. 
But but second of all, I, I feel that way too. Like I wake up every day and I'm like, I can't believe that just happened. You know, I can't believe this happened with Google or I can't believe this happened with attribution or I can't believe this happened in, in, in more tangibly and tactically, like, you know, like businesses that go under, businesses that make it, like things are happening that just feel so shocking. And then as we were prepping for this talk and this call, Perry said something that, you know, in true Perry Marshall form was massively contrarian. Perry goes, actually, the future is more predictable than you think. And I'm like, well, shit, <laughs> I can't wait to hear how and why Perry thinks that like there's there's more predictability. And and normally if somebody told me that I'd be so skeptical, but because I know enough about you, I'm just excited. So I'd love to I'd love to learn how it is and why it is that you think there's there's more visibility into the future than, than I do. Because, man, I feel full on chicken little. The sky is falling ostrich, bury my head in the sand and hope it all turns out for the best. Well, I relate to your feeling and it, 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 there's certainly aspects of the world that four months from now you can't predict. But if you want to predict the future, you start with what's not going to change because it's way easier to figure out what's going to stay the same than it is what's going to be different. And so I am pretty sure that 500 years from now, people are going to sit at chairs and tables and eat food with knives and spoons and forks, and they'll still be drinking coffee, tea, bourbon, wine, milk, and water. I, I'm sure that those those soft drinks will still be around, and uh, and human beings will still be human beings. And uh, I think one of the most useful things uh, about figuring out the future is what's called the Lindy effect, which says that how long something's been around is how long it's going to be around. So, uh, and it comes from a cafe near Broadway called Lindy's where all of the actors and actresses would get together and they would say, well, well, how long is this show going to run? And the answer was, well, it's been running a week. I'll give it another week. If it's been running a month, I'll give it another month. If Fan of the Opera has been playing for 30 years, I'll give it another 30 years. Mm. If, it, if uh, Wicked has been running for 20 years, I'll give it another 20. So, um, so COVID hits and people go, oh my God, cash is going to go away because nobody's going to want to touch a dollar bill. You go, well, how long has cash been around? Uh, 5,000 years, I'll, I'll give it another 5,000. Mm. Yeah. How long has the Torah been around? 4,000 years, I'll give it another 4,000. That, that's, if you want to predict the future, you start with that. And, and so I've been thinking very hard about, just like everybody is, where is AI going? What is happening? And I started making a list of things and I made a list of equivalencies and I, I, I made a list of what got decimated in the 2000s. And I came up with things like yellow pages, newspapers, print and media advertising, travel agencies, um, physical recorded music like CDs, um, film photography, and all of that got decimated by the internet. And then I made a list of, so what are the equivalent things that are going to be decimated by AI? And so I'm, I'm going to give you a, a framework of how I think about this. So history doesn't exactly repeat itself, but it rhymes. And history mm -hmm. is fractal. And so I took the idea of history rhyming, not repeating, but rhyming. And I said, so I'll give you an example. Travel agencies got decimated by the internet 20 years ago. Anybody that's old enough clearly remembers that. Well, I think digital marketing agencies are equivalent to travel agencies. And I think digital agencies are going to get decimated by AI. And then you have to ask, no, this is where it gets super interesting uh, and not just scary. Like, okay, I know people run agencies. Or you guys even run agencies. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? Well, 
So let's think through what actually happened when the travel agencies got taken out. What what did they get taken out by? Aggregators. Expedia, TripAdvisor, Airbnb, Orbitz, mm-hmm. right? Southwest Airlines website. All right. Now, next question. What did not change? Travel. That's the, li- travel. That's the Lindy question. What didn't change? People still travel. People still travel. Matter people- of fact, you could, you could make the case that people traveled more when the travel agents didn't get in the way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that takes us to the very next question, which is every time there's a decimation, something goes 10x, maybe 100, maybe 1,000x. Let, let me jump to film cameras. Film cameras got wiped out. And people stopped taking pictures entirely. Of course they did. <laughs> Anymore. Nobody takes pictures. Though. Right. Actually, pictures went a thousand X. Dude, the amount of times I've had it's so sad because I think I pay for Google One on four different Google accounts because my Google Photos gets maxed out and it, <laughs> it cross devices and I haven't done a good job syncing it between this, that, and whatever. So the, I pay for storage on photos that Perry I'll never look at again. <laughs> you know what I mean? That I don't even know what they are or why they are, but because I take so many stupid pictures. Yep. Which you just underscored the point. Is there less money made via photography mm. or more money now compared to 1995? So how much money is made on photos and digital advertising? How much money is made by clickbait headlines? How much money is made by Facebook and Instagram posts? How much money is made by Kasim having four Google accounts that he can't figure out how to condense down to one? A a whole lot more than Photomat and Kodak. Or the $800 processing fees that we used to like pay every single month between myself and my wife, which (laughs) probably probably in storage, probably it's about about that's the same. You yeah, know, if you really think about it, sure. Or how about maps? You know, the Rand McNally Road Atlas kind of, you know, went out of fashion. Mm. But think about it: people use maps a hundred times more than they did in the 1990s. A lot of people use a map everywhere they go in their car. Why? Because they need traffic. Mm-hmm. They need the little traffic thing to tell them to avoid 290. Yep. Oh, dude, I do that. I could All be traveling time. 10 minutes from my house and I'm going to Google map it because I know Google will tell me the, not the most efficient route based off of what's going on near me. I think that's, I actually think it's stupid not to at this point. And when I don't use it, like I did yesterday, I was going back caught. to Boston. I was like, ah, I don't need to use Waze this time. I got caught and yep. it took me twice as long. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> yep. Should have used Waze. Dude, I used to deliver pizza pre-smartphone. When I was, I was 18, 19 years old and I'm delivering pizza and they had this huge map of the city of Albuquerque on the back of a, and not even the city, like just the little area that we served mm-hmm. and you had to find the house and then I'd write on my hand, left, right, right, left, left. You know what I mean? And, and that was the way that I found these dumb houses. Pizza delivery has gotten exponentially more effective now that the pizza delivery kid has an app in his phone. Yeah. Yes. Which means so, more pizza deliveries. More pizzas. <laughs> so if you start with Lindy, And you say, what did not fundamentally change? People sharing pictures with each other. Mm. And and the current way of doing it gets decimated. That means there's a future version that's going to 10x or 100x or 1,000x. And it's probably not going to be a direct business, but indirectly there's going to be all kinds of money made on that new business. And so a lot of people are... So I went to a party in New York City, a private party um, in October, and Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning economist who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, was the guest speaker, and he was talking about AI. And everybody in the room, they were doctors, lawyers, professors, actors. It was a pretty high and kind of a left-leaning, you know, urban New York City intellectual crowd. And nobody at that party was optimistic about AI. And there was an actress. So surprising to me. 
there was an actress sitting next to me. She goes, so I had a gig at Disney. They did a 360 degree camera thing. I signed my life away. They can make Barbie dolls out of me. They can make CGI movies out of me. Why is anybody going to need an actor or an actress? Is anybody ever even going to care if real actors or actress even acted in a movie? Or are we just going to have AI generated movies? And she was very despondent. Yeah. I am not pessimistic about AI. Now, I am, I am exquisitely clear about all the problems. If you know me, if you follow me, I can find problems anywhere. I mean, that's what makes me a good consultant. I, I get it. All the dystopias I, I totally get. But this has been going on for 500 years. For 500 years, oh, you know, looms are going to replace people weaving cloth and, and, and like, oh, you know, calculators are, oh, spreadsheets are going to replace accountants. When did a spreadsheet ever replace an accountant? Accountants. Use spreadsheets all day long. No, nobody would ever tell your accountant, hey, you need to go back to calculators. You know, those all those complicated, you know, all those formulas, you need to do those by hand. They're taking away your job. So what I say is the job AI took away from you, you never really liked in the first place. Think about it. You're 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 running Facebook accounts. Oh, I just love coming up with clickbait headlines. That is my favorite thing in the whole world. I just love looking at all those stats and figuring out which of those ads. I, I like going from, from ad group to ad group to ad group going, uh, keep delete, keep delete. Oh, that's fun. Mm. That's exactly what I want to do. Mm. And isn't it true what you really want to do is solve a larger level problem isn't it true? You didn't want to drill. You wanted a hole. So I say computers don't unemploy people. Computers employ people. In fact, the problem isn't being employed. The problem is making sure you don't get enslaved. There's always going to be a job. And I, I'm seeing another thing. I know a bunch of AI people and I talk to them all the time and I'm really, I'm, I'm doing an AI seminar in April and I think some of the friggin' smartest people in the world are, I'm, I'm talking to them all the time. And one of the things that I am noticing, so Josh Pelliser told me this, he said, I wanted to study philosophy in school. And when I went to the advisor at the university to sign up, he said, well, there's just one phrase you need to know if you study philosophy, and it's, would you like fries with that? <laughs> but but he, he went into philosophy anyway. He said, you know, I learned all these mental models, and I learned all of these, you know, ways of thinking about stuff. And now that I have all these thinking and mental models, I can say to an AI, apply the Socratic method to this document or like, like I, I, um, one time I, I, I wrote the craziest prompt in chat GPT. I said, I said, tell me the process by which somebody gets nominated for a Nobel prize and put it in the structure of box Brandenburg concertos. And it goes, well, Box Brandenburg concertos have these six sections, and the first one is this, and the second one is this, and the second one is this. And if we cast uh, applying for Nobel Prize into that structure, it looks like this, number one, number two. And it was like, dang. Now, you may think that's useful. You may think it's useless. But the point is, is one out of 100 of those is going to be like a flippin' incredibly useful way to solve a problem that nobody in the history of the earth has ever solved a problem. And if you can ask questions, so back to my original point about it two minutes ago was, there's a whole bunch of people that learned literature and they played Dungeons and Dragons, or they studied philosophy, or they're like crazy into skateboarding or some weird thing. 
And all of a sudden that becomes incredibly easy because you can just, you can ask some question from some weird corner of the universe. You can apply it to something you're doing right now, get a completely unique answer. And you have, might have to do it 20 times, but, but 5% of the time you're going to come up with something that's pure gold and it's completely original. And Sam Wood says, we are at the first time in history that the machine adapts to you instead of you having to adapt to machine. So like if you bought a chainsaw to chop a tree down, you had to learn to use the chainsaw. The chainsaw did not learn anything about you. We are not the first time where a human being can speak in plain English to a machine and just like keep rinse repeating until the machine figures out how you talk and what you want and how you think. And so we can go to future things. Like I think sooner or later, we are going to figure out, somebody's going to figure out how to make self-driving cars work. It's been a bitch of a problem. But I know that, let me tell you how I know they're going to solve it. I remember four or five years ago, I saw some blog post somewhere that said, how long do you think it's going to be before AI can write a New York Times bestselling book. And I laughed. I thought, that's ridiculous. That's redonkulous. Never. Oh, 30 years, maybe. Optimistic. Uh, I don't think that's 30 years away. I think with winning now, literature competitions now, isn't it? Like, that's the big. Yeah. yeah. Like, now somebody will have to prompt it with a whole bunch of, you know, philosophical, structural, here's how I want the story to go. But They'll put that in, and then it will spit out a New York Times bestseller. That's going to happen. I was way off on that. I didn't realize that an awful lot of human language is just patterns. But mm. some people figured that out. And so I know, therefore, based on that, they're going to figure out self-driving cars. So people needing to move people or things from point A to point B is the Lindy thing. And that is not going to change. But when there are self-driving cars and probably automobile ownership may go away, you may not have, you may not need a driveway. Why would I need a driveway? I don't need to own a car, but there's going to be 10 X to hundred X more of some kind of transportation going on. Because we got rid of, you have to own a car, you have to pay the insurance, you have to take it to the mechanic, that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to go, do you remember what a pain in the ass it was to have a car? It was almost like owning a horse. It pooped all over the place. You had to clean up. You, you had to feed it every day. You had to have a stable. You had to have a garage. You had to have a mechanic. <laughs> Guess, so you so. can't figure out what's going to happen in the future. So what's some other things? So I think that, okay, here's an, here's an, um, I think subject matter experts are going to move in a very similar trajectory as recorded music. So I do these, uh, local workshops called Perry Marshall Live. And about three years ago, I was doing one in Nashville. And a guy that came to the Nashville was a guy who worked the Nashville music scene. And he had a company that figured out for medium-sized artists, your music is being used on YouTube videos and TikTok videos and Facebook videos and social media posts. And we have the technology to figure this out. And we send letters to Yahoo and Facebook and we get the royalties that you're supposed to get paid on that stuff. And, and we take 10%. And he told me the most fascinating thing. So I had this idea of what had happened with recorded music. I'm like, well, Spotify pays five thousandths of a penny per song play, which is virtually nothing. There's no money in recorded music anymore. And he goes, no, 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 no. What? He says, he says, artists make a 
teeny tiny amount of money on one song play, but there's so many more song plays now than there was 30 years ago. There is so much activity on the internet. He goes 50 years ago, the money that an artist made was one third recordings, one third live performance and one third merch. Hmm. He said today it's still one third recordings, one third live and one third merch. And what has Spotify and YouTube done to the price of a concert ticket? Through the roof. Through the roof. Yeah. Insane. Insane. So I have a prediction. Um, I I have a a sort of kind of think it'll happen prediction, and I have a certain this will happen prediction. My sort of kind of think it'll probably happen prediction is that the laws around AI will say that if your AI was trained on copyrighted material, you have to pay the copyright holder some minuscule sliver, just like Spotify. Those kind of bills are in Congress right now. I sort of kind of think that might happen. Mm. And what I know will happen is that the the level of trust in digital stuff, in digital information, is going to go down. Mm. And the need for trust in a live human being yep. that you can trust, that you know you can trust, is going to go through the roof. I think that's the trajectory for, for subject matter experts. So if you go back to live music... If you're a tiny little band and you've got like a thousand followers on Spotify, you're not going to tour and you like you're you, you, you can't even make it work. But if you're Taylor Swift, you're creating a billion dollars just by going on tour. And um, I found out from a music promoter the other day that when a band like Taylor Swift goes on tour, Live Nation will go to that artist. They will pay him 100% to 102% of the ticket price because they know they'll make $44 per attendee on food and beverage at a concert. And they know they make $65 a a head on Jimmy Buffett because his people drink more. (laughs) On parking... Totally makes sense. So okay, and so and so, I think in the next five years there is going to be a huge premium on trust because of deep fakes and all the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, so I believe that to a greater degree, in in like in large, low resolution terms, you can make a lot of predictions about the future and be right about them. And I'm putting my money on some of those things. It's fascinating so the because- take home message here is make sure to attract alcoholic clientele because they're worth more money. 65 bucks a head yeah. in free beverage at the Jimmy Buffett concert. That's right. I have a mild. So first of all, Perry, I love everything you're saying. It's tons of fun to think about. And I imagine as with all things that I encounter with you, I'll, I'll learn more as I spend more time thinking about it, which is a compliment. Here's my, here's my, objection to the Lindy effect, which I imagine there's a quick answer for. The, the way that you've identified what's going to stay is brilliant and fun to think about. But the Lindy effect, like how long has the internet been around? Mm-hmm. 50 years. So I'll give it 50 more years. It, it feels like it applies to uh, the incumbents, but it doesn't apply to any of the newcomers. So like, how long has AI been around? It, and, and the answer is probably longer, but let's say, you know, chat GPT has been two years. So we'll say two years. So I'll give it another two years. Right. But we know that's not true, right? Like the internet has a hundred million years and AI, pro- how long has cryptocurrency been around? 10 years. So I'll give it another 10 years. Mm-hmm. I feel like Lindy works really well for the things that we know are established, but it doesn't work well for these these new technologies trying to figure out what is going to make an impact and what is going to go by the wayside 
And the specific example I'll offer is prompt engineering. The whole world is obsessed with prompt engineering. That's the thing that you, you know people are taking courses on and being trained on because they think they're going to need to be prompt engineers. One of the smartest AI guys I know, Perry Belcher, says prompt engineering's it's got 18 months because the AI is going to, to the point that you just made quoting Sam Woods, AI is going to learn you to a point to where you're not going to need to be a prompt engineer anymore. So mm-hmm. how do we know of what's new, what's <laughs> going to stay? Is there a Lindy equivalent? Well, I, I think, yeah, I love what you said because you very well may be right that if LLMs have been hot for two years, I'd only be sure that they're going to make it another two years before they're replaced by somebody else. Like how long, well, how long have travel agents been around? Like go back 20 years and well, travel agents have been around, I don't know, a hundred years or something. So like, well, and travel agents are still around, but what do travel agents do now? They sell $70,000 vacations to people that go on cruises and like really expensive, like high, super high end stuff. And those are still around. That's also going to apply to marketing agencies. There's, there's always going to be high end marketing agencies, but if you can read it out of Perry's book, then a machine can learn how to do it. Like if it's just like copy procedure, standard op SOP stuff that you outsource to Filipino VAs, like that ain't going to last very long. And so right. it forces us to go to a whole level of learning, which is what I said about philosophers. You know, these are people that think about thinking and they love to ask questions. I think we are moving from a obsession with answers to the new kings of the universe are people who are obsessed with questions unanswered questions, really hard, difficult questions, questions that make most ice glaze over. Those are the people who are all of a sudden going to be the new nerds and the new geeks, like nerds and geeks used to be horrible like 30 years ago. And now they're kings of the universe. I I think think we're going to have a whole new generation advanced beyond what the tech nerds of, of, of the current time are doing. Mm. When I talk to people about AI, and I'll just give an example of it. We had some folks over this weekend, and they're both in industries that are non-digital related. And I found myself pontificating about what you see right now in AI is the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. And it's going to be a force multiple. I look at it as a very, very positive thing. Mm -hmm. And there is so much evidence now of what you're saying for in-person tangible, like I can see, feel the human experience. Like look at the Eras tour with Taylor Swift. Unbelievable. I sent my kids to Travis Scott over Christmas. You guys might not even know who he's one of the most popular, absolutely insane, like following huge downloads on Spotify. People are craving this in-person experience, this new Like, I'm not even a cruise ship person, this new Titanic of the seas, this thing. It's like five Titanics and one is the biggest cruise ship ever. It's sold out for seven months. People are craving in-person experiences. And I see it as a reaction to everything that's going on right now, so much so. But then when I talk to the average person, I was talking to somebody who works for the IRS and then another one who's an architect and all they see is doom and gloom when it comes to AI. And mm-hmm. I'm sure you must face this. They're like, oh, but then, you know, there's not going to be any like actors. Any, like, the actor one was one of the things that they brought up when you said, it. I'm like, oh my God, I have this conversation so much. And I try and portray it as this is actually a really positive thing. Like, what do you say to those people? How do you sort of broad brush it? Not necessarily to the digital marketing crowd, the perpetual traffic listener, but just in general, like this is not doom and gloom. Yes, there could be some downside to it. You might not know what's real and what's not real on the internet. Of course, got that deep fakes, you know, the Pope wearing the funny white parka, all that sort of stuff. I think like, he how did do you that, ex- by the way. How do you explain it? Like, how do you talk to people about it? I had a roundtable meeting mastermind last week, and one of my members made, I think, an incredibly sharp observation. He said he said, I've been training my team on AI. And he goes, 
He goes, I think you're smoking dope if you think that most people are going to sit there and make their own GPT bots and automate their whole job. He goes, the average person is not going to do that. They don't have enough willpower. They don't have enough agency. They don't have enough curiosity. They just kind of want to be told what to do. And so, so there's kind of a downside mm-hmm. to this answer, which is, frankly, I think 80 or 90% of people are just going to float like a fish downstream and they're going to do whatever, just like social media. We've already been through this, but 10% are going to be hugely empowered. And one of the one of the biggest things about AI and about technology in general is technology turns what used to be 80-20 into 90-10. Mm-hmm. 80-20 says 20% creates 80% of the results and 80% creates 20% of the results That's true in the high friction brick and mortar world. That's true of plumbers and taco stands and, and, you know, automobiles and roads and and all that kind of stuff. It's all that stuff is 80, 20 internet is 90, 10 on the internet. 10% of the companies have 90% of the business and 90% of the companies have 10% of the business. And the difference between the haves and have nots is not 16 to one. It's 80 to one. And what you're going to see is the people who own their power, own their agency, are curious, ask questions, deliberately evolve, deliberately adapt, deliberately pursue a future, are going to be much more powerful than people ever were before. And then there's going to be a whole lot of fish floating down the stream. And that's just the good and the bad. It, it, it's, it is going to be what it is going to be. The thing is, is you get to decide, am I in the bottom 90% or am I going to be in the top 10%? And this is the agility decade, like if there ever was one. And you, you need to have faith, and I don't think there's any other word for it. You need to have faith that what you learned before that became obsolete is still useful in some other context, mm. if you can make the analogy, it's not going to it's not going to work directly the same. But like, if you were a photographer in the 1990s, you acquired a whole lot of skills about how to see the world and how to compose a picture. And then when they gave you a digital camera, there were so many more things you could take a hundred times more pictures and look at them and sift them and sort them and make better photography than ever before. But if you were all, ah, the sky is falling about film cameras, you missed it. It went completely over your head. Yeah. The world's going 90, 10, man. I, look, good, bad, or different. I knew it had to come back to an 80-20 analogy. (laughs) Well, what's nice is Perry has to write another book now. Because 80-20 is outdated and now we need 90-10. If you want to understand 90-10, start by understand 80-20 really, really well. Because it's only a little different. It's just more unequal. And and so the, the world runs on inequality. And people that grew up in a democracy and we're all equal and... You know, we're endowed by the creator with inalienable rights, right? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, all that stuff. It's all, I I believe it. It's all spiritually true, but it has this tendency to blind you to the fact that the world is ridiculously unequal. Cause and effect are ridiculously unequal. Some people are ridiculously more powerful than others. Are you going to be weak or are you going to be powerful? You know, the, the best thing you can do for the poor is not be one of them. Mm. amen to that it's fun because we just gave our listener the action item in your business or in your industry what's the 80 20 because that's Mm going to go 90 10 yep and then put it through this this lindy effect lens what's always been and i love the way that you started perry 
Well, we know it's not going to change. So in your business, you're just, and it, you know, this isn't a fool's errand. And it wouldn't be a Pyrrhic victory to identify what are the things in your world that are not going to change. And oh, you, you got to do business on that. Yeah. 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 So everybody listening, you have some homework. Um, what a fun conversation that could catalyze too if you did that with your executive staff. That it, should be in your quarterly meeting if you're in a business. Like what's not going to change? One of yeah. what's not going to change. Well, it's fun because what I want to know is I want to know where two really smart mm-hmm. people disagree. Oh, that's good. Oh, goodness. Right. How much right. fun would that be to figure out two really smart people disagree on, on what's not going to change? Mm-hmm. Now we're cooking with something that looks like oil, you know? Yeah. 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 Amen, brother. Preach it. Preach it. Do it. Well, there's your action item. Perry Marshall, so happy, pleased, excited, grateful to have you on. Uh, Grateful for your wisdom, grateful for your guidance through the years. Where can people find you now? I know you do do in-person stuff, a lot of that. I do. So where can people best connect with you? Go to perrymarshall.com and you can... You can find my 80-20 book. You can find the Perry Marshall Lives that I do around the country. You can find our AI seminar. You can get prognostications about the future and where it's all going. Uh, Like sleep with one eye open, man, because it's intense. (laughs) I love it. It's just not not a kid's nursery rhyme or a Metallica song. You heard it here first from Perry Marshall. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Uh, Make sure that wherever you do listen to podcasts, subscribe and leave a rating. Uh, We do appreciate that. Of course, follow myself on LinkedIn, uh, Ralph Burns, and then Qasim on all socials at Qasim Aslam. Go back and listen to previous episodes. We will leave links in the show notes in ways in which you can connect with Perry over at perpetualtraffic.com. And of course, make sure that you check out our YouTube channel at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. So uh, thanks once again, Perry, for coming on PT this week. Uh, maybe we'll have you on in another 500 episodes, I suppose. No, we'll do it way before then. This is no, that's the Lindy fun. rule, Ralph. It took 500 rule. to get Perry on, oh, so we're going to have to get another 500. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It works in the podcasting world as that's well. Right. Of course. Why wouldn't it? So on behalf of my awesome co-host, Qasem Aslam. Peace. Until next show. See ya.